Hey guys, it's True Crime in Colorado here. So we know there's a lot of controversy regarding this book, but there definitely are some very interesting pieces of the puzzle that we did get from it. We obviously, you know, you got to take, when Chris talks, you got to take his words with a grain of salt. But every time he comes out with one of these new versions, and this is his third, of course, he drops clues and little nuggets of truth with his lies. So between, you know, we read the first one over and then listened to the second one again, read the book and went through, over, you know, went over some key points in discovery this weekend. It really does paint a clearer picture of what happened that night for us. Anyway, I thought it did fill in some of the questions. There's still some questions that I just don't know will ever be answered, but some of that stuff you can cross reference with the facts, which I always go back to the discovery because the facts, you know, Chris cannot twist them as much as he wants to. You kind of can piece together most of it. So for those of you who haven't read the book or don't want to, or if you have, but you just want to go over some parts that are worthy of discussion, that's what we're going to do in this video. So in chapter one, the author's just explaining basically how she met the Watts and how she started writing to Chris and how the whole relationship came about. So she started writing him on February 10th. And in that letter, she basically just came out and said she wanted to write a book about the case. And then he wrote back to her March 14th, 2019, which as we all know is exactly one week after that second confession was released to the public. And then one day after he wrote her, he must have told Cindy because Cindy called Sherilyn and told her that she had begged Chris to fill Sherilyn in with the missing pieces for them. And then Cindy was the one who sent Sherilyn the papers to apply to be put on Chris's visitor list. And then she visited him for the first time on April 5th. She does bring up a couple of things. She talks about how when she met him, he looked completely different than he did in the sentencing, but then she doesn't elaborate on how. She just says he looked totally different, which I wish she would have explained what she meant by that. The One of the most interesting things I got out of this chapter was that she does point out that Chris was quote unquote resentful of when the CBI and FBI showed up for that February interview and that it was his opinion that it seemed like they were trying to find out with their questions if Nicole had anything to do with the murders. She also mentions in this chapter that Christopher now lives with great remorse, which is a bunch of crap unless she means that he has remorse about getting caught, which is the only thing that this guy has remorse for. We, I mean, you can tell. There's, he feels sorry for himself. And as you go through the book, it becomes painfully obvious that he doesn't give two craps about what he did. It is all about poor Chris, the victim Chris, who's been victimized his whole life by woman after woman. And he's just this victim and this puppet by all these evil women that have controlled him. And it's just such a load of crap. Um... And then she brings up his faulty thinking, which he has throughout this entire book with what happened to after what happened. And then now in prison, he sits there still with the same completely delusional, faulty thinking. And he tells himself that, you know, if he's got good behavior and stuff, that he's going to end up being free someday. And she mentions, and I do agree with her on this part, that it's just a coping mechanism for him because he cannot come to terms with the fact that he is never getting out of there. Chapter two is really short, but it talks about Chris's early years. Basically, it's most of the stuff we've already heard. Cindy talks about that he's never been openly affectionate. And once again, another person saying that he never showed emotion. So, I mean, we've got his parents and his in-laws and his friends. And everyone's saying that he never showed emotion, which obviously, I mean, in my opinion, he's got any social personality disorder and I think that that's why he stayed in the background and was fine, you know, flying under the radar and just kind of blending in because he knew something was wrong with him. And he it was easier for him to assimilate to how other people were by just kind of letting other people take control and tell him what to do because he didn't know how to operate like other people did. One piece of information that I thought was kind of interesting in here was Cindy said that they were religious growing up. Chris attended a Baptist church. She said that she could hear him in the bathroom repenting over and over to God for sins that he felt he had committed. Cindy said that he would never tell her what those sins were, but he would just sit in there and repeat himself in an OCD manner. 
And so that's something that stuck out to her that he did. And if you put that with the fact that when all his friends would go to the dances, he stayed at home on the couch with his parents and he didn't have girlfriends. He was, he, he only had like two friends growing up and he just, it's clear that there were some signs that, that Chris was mentally off that were missed. And you know, who knows? I mean, they could have written that off as just, well, that's Chris. But looking back, it does seem like there were some signs he had antisocial personality disorder and some other things, but that he was a little off. And then the other thing that was interesting in here is that Cindy said the last time she saw Chris before the murders was August 5th. He told her that he and Shanann would be separating. Cindy told him that she hoped he wasn't seeing someone outside his marriage, and he assured her that he wasn't. So a lot of us have heard conflicting information on that. I remember at the beginning of the case on Web Sleuths, Jamie was on there, I think it was under Tinker 78, something like that, where she said that they did know about the extramarital affair with Nicole. So I've seen conflicting information on that, so I'm not sure. I guess take from that what you will and believe what you will on that. Chris does mention in this chapter that it's always been very important to him what people think of him and that he's always tried to be a good person and be kind. Uh, It bothers him that people hate him over this and as he puts it, quote unquote, judge him. So poor Chris. There's a lot of poor Chris moments in this book. And he says he has these comments throughout the book that you just sit there and think, really? He's completely delusional. But he also mentions at the end of the chapter that it's not easy for people to let go of what happened. Chapter three just talks about how Shanann worked for Thrive. And he says that he was wearing the DFT duo patch, which caused his heart rate to speed up like he was working out all day. He says that because of that, he could only sleep about three hours per night. Um, And then the next part's interesting because of the oxydrama that went on last week. We have a separate video you should probably watch that kind of breaks down the oxy information. But for those of you who know, he said that he, he told the author that he would take the identity of the person who gave him the oxy to his death. He said that about a couple things. But then he went back the next day and said that no, you know, that was misunderstood. He actually got it from the bin in their basement, which we know is not true. That doesn't make any sense. So in this part, he says, because of living in Colorado and taking Thrive, Shanann did not have to take any medication. So just another indication that he was lying about that. He then talks about how Shanann earned a lot of free trips, which we already know. And then he says that since he worked a full-time job, he wasn't free to go on all these trips. And that's when he would stay home and take care of the girls. He goes into the June 22nd trip that they went on to San Diego with Thrive. And this part's interesting because this is where he really starts talking about his relationship with Nicole. And obviously, a lot of us have always been suspect of the timeline of their relationship with how serious it got and how it escalated so quickly. And at first, he kind of lines up with what he said in February that they had started talking in May or flirting or whatever. And then the same week that she announced her pregnancy is when things, the flirtation was kind of getting intense which is why he explains he wasn't that excited about the pregnancy announcement on the video. So here is where he contradicts himself again, in our opinion, on the timeline of the relationship. And I'm reading this directly from the book. He says, the very same week he had started to see Nikki was when he found out Shanann was pregnant. He was caught off guard by the announcement because it had taken Shanann much longer to get pregnant the last two times. But then he goes down to say on the very same page, Now he felt he was not ready for this baby because mentally he was with Nikki. So again, he says above that he began to see Nikki in May. But before he had just said that they were only talking at work, it was casual and they were flirting and he didn't see her till they got back from their San Diego trip. So there's another conflicting statement, you know, just our opinion, but we've never believed the timeline on the relationship it just doesn't line up. I don't care what anyone says. There is no way that we would ever believe that this thing didn't start well before May or June because I don't understand how your mind could be with Nikki if you just started talking that week. That would be an easy thing to break out of and refocus on your marriage and the pregnancy. And it also lines up with the fact, you know, of course, 
the infamous Google searches that Nicole did on Shanann and Chris a year before the murders. Chris tells her that he was caught off guard because he had never had a woman pursue him before. She lured him with lewd sex and sent nude pictures of herself on his personal phone. Nikki was definitely chasing him. She knew he was married and had two girls, but in fairness, she was told by Christopher that he and Shanann had both decided to separate. This part is interesting. She could have gotten so much more detail here, but there's some ambiguous parts here, but I'll get to that. She writes, she most likely knew about Shanann's pregnancy because she spent time looking up Shanann on Facebook and the internet, which, of course, we know. She possibly wanted Shanann's life. We personally agree with that statement. Who knows if she saw her when she worked at Advocare and Shanann was at Thrive, or if she just, if Chris caught her eye and then she kind of looked him up on Facebook and saw Shanann. But I do agree with that statement. I also think that she obviously watched Shanann's Facebook videos and with so many of them being public she knew exactly what was going on with their relationship what trips they were going on and that Shanann was pregnant and then it just goes on to talk about how Shanann had everything that would make a mistress jealous the beautiful home the perfect husband two beautiful kids and by all appearances basically had the perfect life and then in typical Chris Watts form After talking about how wonderful she made him feel and how, you know, in love with her he was, he starts talking bad about Nicole to the author. So he talks about how she would pull out every stop to seduce and intoxicate him and that he spent all of his time with Nikki the month of July. He practically lived at her house and didn't have any time to think about what he was doing and that when he was with her, he didn't think about his family. And here's a creepy statement, as though he didn't have one. And... I'm not trying to minimize her role in it. She was definitely a catalyst and we, the creators of this channel are among the people that do believe that there's much more to this story and that she had some type of more involvement or knowledge than she's acknowledging. I just think there's so many things that point to that again, just our opinion, but at the same time, it's funny how he, I mean, everyone else, has a role in what he did except for himself. So now he's projecting that it was all her. And he's just, again, kind of this, you know, victim that's being drugged through this stuff and has no control over his actions. He says how Nicole became the injured party in her eyes instead of seeing Shanann as the injured party, which was actually the situation. He talks about how she, quote unquote, pulled the last punch by telling them that she wanted to give him a son. And she knew that she could get Chris to feel bad for her by telling him that they didn't have any firsts together. And Chris then says that this is when he feels that the idea to kill his family started. And if you read on, and we'll get into that, but the July 14th second visit that Nikki had to their house, when she went upstairs and saw the whole house, Um, it looks like that was kind of the catalyst to the plan because they had this big fight. She was really upset asking him to make a choice and got very emotional and stormed out of the house and sat in her car for 30 minutes in his driveway, texting back and forth. And he was able to, in his words, talk her off the ledge and get her back in and cuddle her on the couch. And this is likely when she said that she wanted to give him a son and he knew that he was, you know, under pressure to make a choice and that he wasn't going to be able to keep things the way they were. And if you look at Discovery, and we'll have another video on this, but it, you can clearly see that after July 14th, he was making active steps almost daily to plan out the murders. Chris says that Nikki had a group of friends that he says were involved in some very dark things. I really, really wish she would have had him specify what those dark things were. I mean, that can mean anything from drugs to, I mean, the the rumors that go around. I mean, this is the kind of stuff that starts rumors to the rumors we've heard about witchcraft and the, the dark, dark stuff. Or did he just mean sexual stuff? It's a very broad term that she uses here, but that's, that's all we get. He can pinpoint a time that he could feel himself getting darker on the inside as well. And then when she asked him what Nikki was really like, he suggested reading Proverbs 7, 5, 27, and that he, she would see Nicole for who she was. 
And these verses in the Bible basically talk about a very sexual woman that doesn't care that she's married. Chapter four is the Watt side of the story. I'm not really going to spend much time at all on this because in my opinion, it's not that important. And it's all he said, she said, and Shanann's not here to defend herself. Talks about the engagement, talks about the fight over the invitations for the shower and how Jamie said she did mail them. Shanann does not think that she did. And then it talks about how they didn't attend the wedding and that Jamie says that Shanann got mad at them and told them not to bother coming, even though they were supposed to be in it. And as we know, Shanann said that they didn't come. Again, he said, she said stuff. And it goes into Nutgate, which the only importance, in our opinion, that this even has is just another piece of the problem. And the timing sucked. They had, you had the affair going, you had the finances going, and then on top of everything else, you've got this huge fight that breaks out, the Nutgate fight breaks out and puts even more pressure on Chris and gives him another excuse to be mad and project this rage onto Shanann over that. Cindy goes on to talk about the hate that they've received from this case. She kind of defends it by saying that they thought that their daughter-in-law had just killed their granddaughters, so of course they weren't happy with her at the time. And all they had was the information that Chris had given to Ronnie and the FBI and that they believed that. It talks about why the Watts did not go to the funeral, and it says that Ronnie made a phone call to one of the family members and was told, not in a malicious way, but told it might be best if they don't come due to the media that was going to be there and that they were probably going to get attacked by people. The Watts did have a service of their own with friends and family. They sang Amazing Grace, and they were very upset that they didn't get to say goodbye to Shanann and their granddaughters, is what they say here. And then it just, the author talks about how sad it was that the two families couldn't get along and that their last visit with Shanann and their granddaughters ended in discord. Chapter five talks about their finances. And of course, we're only getting Chris's version, which as we know is probably not true, but he talks about the school that the girls went to and how Shanann controlled the finances and loved to shop. And yet again, he's just along for the ride. He says that he didn't know what was going on in their finances and he was afraid to ask her and that basically she had control over everything, didn't trust him with the money and that they had already filed for bankruptcy once and they were headed that way again and were probably going to lose the house before they had the opportunity to sell it. He does openly admit that he never voiced his concerns to Shanann and she can't read his mind so he kind of wants it both ways. He wants to complain about the fact that he never had a say, but then at the same time, he admits that he never spoke his mind about anything because he likes to be in the background. One thing that I did find interesting at the end of chapter five is, if you'll remember right after the sentencing, there was a hearing that had some HIPAA issues and he had, there's, there were some records that were sealed. And she briefly touches on that here. She says, The girl's records were sealed by Chris right after the sentencing, even though he does not remember signing them. No one seems to know why. He says it was a stipulation for his plea agreement. He was not clear-headed, and he says he does not remember everything that happened during that time, which I don't believe any of that stuff. However, what's interesting to me, and I guess anyone correct me if I'm wrong in how I'm interpreting this, but how I'm reading this is that He agreed to sign the plea agreement as long as they agreed to seal and hide some of the girls' records pertaining to this case. So that's it for part one of this series. Part two will be out today also. We're going to start at chapter six, which dives into his relationship with Nicole, and go right up through chapter 11, which goes into the actual murders. So thank you for giving us a little bit of your time. Please like the video and don't forget to subscribe to our channel.